that with our finances too. Amen. Amen. God does not need our money. He wants our hearts and learning to rely on him and being a faithful steward of what he has given you for his glory. That's what these few weeks have been all about. Uh, whatever it takes. Luke chapter 19, if you got your Bibles this morning, and I certainly hope that you brought them. Luke 19, the year was 1939 and farmers in Oklahoma faced an excruciating choice. And that choice was whether to use their last remaining wheat seed to feed their families, because obviously you can eat it, um, or um, they could do that for a few months while they sold off their, their farms and they moved back east, or they could plant those seeds and hope for rain. You see, here was their dilemma. In the 1920s, many of them had left their low-paying factory jobs in the Northeast for a chance of fortune in the great American Midwest. Things had gone, had gone amazing for a few years, but in 1931, Oklahoma went through the worst drought in recorded history. To make matters worse, years of sloppy farming techniques had destroyed all the prairie grasses that preserved ground moisture, which resulted in these massive dust storms. You've heard about it. It's why they call it the Dust Bowl. Whole fortunes disappeared in billowing dull gray plumes of dust. By the fall of 1939, many farmers had just enough grain left, just enough to feed themselves and their families for a few months. Um, they could eat it and move back east or, or they could plant that and wait for rain. If rain came, they would harvest a hundredfold, but if not, they would be left with nothing. Many, many planted in hope that rain would come and thankfully in the fall of 1939, it did. Harvesting always involves risk. Because when you sow something, you release control over it. And if the harvest doesn't come, then you lose it. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about risking your future on the kingdom of God. And that all comes to a head in this parable Jesus tells in Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 11, if you got your Bible, Jesus proceeded to tell them a parable. Because he was coming near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Sometimes you wonder why Jesus is telling a parable. What's he thinking about? Well, Luke tells you exactly why he tells this particular parable. Some of his disciples supposed that when Jesus got to Jerusalem, he would establish his kingdom and commence his reign. But, but Jesus knows that there are things that await him there that the disciples are not aware of, namely that he's going to be rejected and crucified, after which he'll be resurrected and ascend into heaven for a number of years while his servants extend his gospel to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus tells them a parable, instructing them in what he wants them to do during that waiting period. Verse 12, and so he said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. This nobleman, of course, represents Jesus. He's telling a story about himself. Verse 13, he gave each of them, calling 10 of his servants, this represents us, the church, he gave them 10 minas. Now, a mina is a unit of money. To be honest, I've never quite understood why translators leave words like this untranslated. I mean, none of us know what it means, right? It's like the translators are moving through the text and they get to this word and they figure they're not getting paid enough to, so they just transliterate it. And they're like, I'll leave it for you pastors to figure out and explain to everybody. Um, Amina was about three months wages. So in our terms, think what, based off the average annual salary in, in Raleigh-Durham of about 60,000 a year, that would be what, $15,000? And he said to them, engage in business until I come. But his, business, his citizens hated him and they sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Jesus is sort of, as an aside, saying, hey, you're gonna live in a hostile world where they're gonna hate the rule of your master. Verse, verse, verse 15, when he returned, having received the kingdom, when Jesus comes back one day, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little, you have, shall have authority over 10 cities. The first thing to notice here is how gracious this master is. These are servants. In fact, the word he uses here means, technically means slave, which was of course the lowest job you could have in that society. Slaves had no rights. They had no real possessions of their own. 
You say, well, is Jesus condoning slavery? No, no more than he is condoning thievery in the parable he tells about the dishonest manager right before this one. He's just using a societal reality as an illustration. These are slaves. And here you've got a master giving slaves rule over cities as a reward for a few months of faithful stewardship. That is not a reward that any master in those days would ever have given to a slave. It'd be like, like driving a, a truck for Amazon. And one day you meet Jeff Bezos and he says, hey, I noticed that you've had three months of on-time deliveries. Your end of year bonus is going to be to oversee all of our warehouses in, in Asia. And I'm going to give you possession of my estate in Hawaii. That is your bonus. This master is crazy generous. Second thing to notice about this master is he's also crazy rich. 10 minas in our terms would be about $150,000. And he calls that faithfulness in a little. When you're in a place where you can call $150,000 insignificant, you're pretty wealthy. Matthew's gospel makes this even more stark, by the way. In Matthew's telling of this parable, Jesus uses talents instead of minas, and a talent was two years' salary, making the doubling of 10 talents amount to more than $2 million. And again, the master calls that faithfulness in the little. When you can call a couple million dollars chump change, you're crazy rich. By the way, you say, well, why did Matthew and Luke record this story differently? Did one of them get the details wrong? No, Jesus was a traveling preacher. And as a traveling preacher, I can tell you, he told this story multiple times. And he probably changed the, the money details from time to time to better fit the context. And Luke and Matthew just recorded different versions of it. Um, if I could just stop here before I keep moving and just say, y'all, God makes such incredible promises to those who follow him. And Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has even entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Eternity with him is going to be incredible. Contrary to what many of us grew up thinking, heaven is not a place of laziness and leisure where we all sit around on clouds wearing diapers, strumming harps and shooting each other with Nerf bows and arrows. In heaven, we work, we work. And that work, some of that work is gonna be reigning and ruling and our work is gonna be fulfilling and satisfying and enjoyable. It's like C.S. Lewis says, entering eternity is not the end of our adventure. It's actually the beginning of it. But here's the thing, y'all. Those promises are only for those who are faithful with what God has given to them here. That's who it's, that's who it's to. You gotta be bold enough to take the risk and put it out there to plant that seed. And some of you know my mom went home to be with the Lord earlier, earlier this year. And as I studied this, this week, it was almost like I could hear her saying, because she talked to me about this so often when I was a kid, I could hear her saying, come on, son, you got this. Don't leave anything on the table. I can see it from my side over here now, and it's totally worth it. What a great cloud of witnesses we have telling us, invest, sow that seed. It's worth it. I hope you can hear their voices this morning. Verse 18, and the second servant came saying, Lord, your mina has made five times. Your one mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are now to be ruler over five cities. I want you to notice that this guy only nets half the return as the previous guy, but the commendation, the well done good servant, that is the same, even though he only gets half the return. Verse 20, then another came to him saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Now, let's be honest, this is kind of an odd response, isn't it? This guy's done nothing with his master's money. He put it into a hanky and stuffed it into the bottom of his underwear drawer. And when called to account about it, he said, well, well, see, you're kind of a jerk. And that's why I didn't do anything with your money. I mean, imagine if you did that with your boss, he gives you an assignment, then he goes away on a three month business trip. And when he comes back, you say, I did nothing while you were gone because you're a jerk. I mean, if he's a jerk, that's all the more reason to be diligent, right? Plus, we've already seen that this master is crazy generous. He was understanding with the guy who only made half the return and he gave out governorships as a bonus. He seems like a great guy to work for. And so the nobleman said to him, verse 22, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank at least? And in my coming might have collected it with interest, you could have at least put it in the bank. I mean, the harder work is to go out and find an investment, use the money to start a business. 
but, but, but you didn't even do that. If you're not going to do that, you could at least have put it into a mutual fund to draw some interest or something. You did nothing. I think what might be the most arresting thing to me in this story is that Jesus uses the word ponere, wicked is how we translate that, ponere to describe this last servant. I, I see that word wicked and I say, wicked, what wicked thing had he done? You look in that parable and you tell me what wicked thing he had done. He did not embezzle the money. He did not blow it on prostitutes or gambling or drugs. In fact, he returned 100% of what he'd been given, not one penny less. And yet, and yet Jesus calls him wicked. Not for something that he did, but because of something that he failed to do. In fact, write this down if you're taking notes. In the kingdom of God, there is more than one way to be wicked. In the kingdom of God, there's more than one way to be wicked. There is the, let's just say, standard way of being wicked. Breaking the 10 commandments, lying, cheating, being an adulterer, you can be wicked that way. But there is a second way to be wicked. And that is by failing to invest your life for the kingdom of God. You might keep all the commandments. You might live a life of virtue and exemplary Christian conduct. You might know all the verses, vote in all the right ways, know every word to every worship song ever written and still be considered by Jesus on judgment day to be wicked. Not because of sins you committed, but because of a life purpose you omitted. If I look around, let's just kind of make this real. Look around at your campus, is it possible that some of the most well put together people in church, those who knew the most about the Bible and, and are in every way good moral people are going to hear Jesus say on that last day, you wicked servant. Friend, that is not only possible, that is prophesied. Verse 24, he said to those who stood by, take this mina from him and give it to those, to the one who has the 10 minas. And they said to him, but Lord, he's already got 10 minas. I tell you, Jesus said though, that everyone who has more will be given and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Those who steward grace well, get even more of it. Those who waste grace, lose it all. But for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me, which is of course a reference to the final judgment. By the way, I do wanna say, you see here that there is indeed a severity to this master. Jesus is crazy generous and kind to those who trust themselves to him, but those who refuse him will find Jesus on that last day to be a terrible enemy. It's like C.S. Lewis always said, God threatens terrible things for those who refuse to be insanely happy in him. You choose now how you're going to meet Jesus. As Joby said a few weeks ago, you either bow or you bow, one of those two. All right, as we've said, Jesus is telling a story, prophesying to the church what the future is gonna be like, and what he expects of us in it. Three questions I want us to consider this morning. Number one, what is it exactly that we have been given? Number two, what does God expect of each of us personally? And number three, what keeps so many of us from investing for the master? Number one, what is it exactly that we've been given? What do these minas represent exactly? Write this down. In short, minas or talents are whatever enablements the master has given us to know him, or make him known. Unfortunately, most people who know this story know it by Matthew's version where Jesus uses the word talents. If you grew up in Sunday school, you probably grew up knowing the story about the talents. And I say that's unfortunate because a lot of people grow up thinking that it means only actual talents. Growing up, we often thought of this like little party tricks or hobbies we should use for Jesus. I'm a juggler for Jesus. I do happy hands and crafts for Jesus. Or if you're like our downtown Durham campus pastor, Rich Bowman, you have the talent of interpretive worship dance. All right, this is an actual picture of him before he came on Sabbath the Summit Church. This is not a joke. He may or may not, we may or may not be using this and putting it on display during our Christmas services this year, okay? Um, and you can access the full video of him doing this. I put, it, I put it as a link in my transcript. So pull up my transcript, you can click on the link and just have the greatest four minutes of your life, okay? Talent here. Talent here does not mean talent like we use the word talent. Talent is the translator's lazy transliteration of talent tone which as we've seen means a unit of gold about two years salary. And so in context, again, minas or talents or whatever enablements the master has given us to know him or make him known. Interestingly, in Matthew's account, this parable is an indictment on the Jewish nation for squandering their favored status as God's chosen people. 
God had given the Jews the incredible blessing of knowing him and the responsibility to make him known to the nations. And the Jewish people had just wasted that, Jesus said. So they lost their status as the people of God. The grace that was theirs, God just took it from them. Here in Luke's account, the focus is a little more on what we, we do with the actual money that we have. Bottom line, you can think of the minas as whatever blessings God has given you to know him and make him known. It's the kind of home, for example, you grew up in, if you grew up in a home like me, the kind of church you had exposure to, the prosperous country that we live in and all the freedoms that we enjoy. These are all blessings that we bear responsibility to multiply regarding our individual resources. We typically talk about, about that in terms of the three T's, okay? And in honor of my son who will always ask for more props every single week, I have little symbols, okay? Three T's, time, okay? That's the watch represents time. That's the time God has given us, 86,400 seconds every day. Treasure, that's the money, okay? This little wad of money, that's all one, so don't think a lot, but uh, just, you know, it's the money that we have. And then this awesome little trophy here, that's gonna be our, our talents. Time is the focus of your time. What are you doing with your days, your career? What are you doing with your retirement? If I asked you what the most important thing to you is, what's your highest priority? Most of you in here would say, Jesus. But what is your calendar? What does your time say you prioritize? Treasures, what do, you, what do you spend your money on? Again, what does your checkbook say your priority is? I know your mouth would say that Jesus is the most important. What does your checkbook say? Your calendar and your checkbook are much better indicators of what's important to you than your, than your mouth is. Your talents, how are you using whatever skills you have? How are you using them? How are you using your career for the kingdom of God? Do you know your spiritual gift and are you using it? You got one, by the way. If you're a believer, do you know what that is and are you using it? See, one day you and I are gonna give an account to the master for how we used all these things, how we used our knowledge of the gospel and our time our treasure and our talents to help others know him, right? So that's question number one is what do these represent? It's whatever resources God has given us to know him and help make him known. Number two, what does God expect of each of us personally? What's he expect of each of us personally? In short, for us to take what he's given us and double it. This parable teaches us that we're not responsible for how much we receive. That's the decision of the master. We're responsible to invest what he's given us according to the abilities that he's given us. The master gave the same commendation to the one who earned back five as he did to the one who earned back 10. Each did according to his own ability. Matthew's version, by the way, makes this even clearer because in Matthew's version, the master actually gives different amounts to each of the servants. So one he gives five, one he gives 10, one he gives one. You see, our master knows, he's acknowledging, listen, that we all start at different places. Perhaps you, like me, you were born into the home of a godly mom and dad and you were given the incredible privilege of growing up in a good church like I did, where you heard the Bible taught consistently and you were around examples of people who both loved you and lived out the gospel in front of you. That's a very different starting point than the little boy who, 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 never, who never knew his father and whose mother struggled with a cocaine addiction. My mom used to always repeat to me the words of Jesus, J.D., to whom much is given, much is required. You, you've been given a lot. Much is gonna be required of you. With great power comes great responsibility. I remember looking back at her and saying, mom, am I Spider-Man? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but you've been given a lot and a lot's required of you. See, there might be pastors out there who reach thousands who are still poorer stewards of what they've received and the man who's just struggling to stay sober as he shares the gospel with his children. Maybe he came from a terrible background, unlike me. Maybe he suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome. He may never be as successful in the eyes of the world as that big mega pastor, but he started with so much less. And maybe it took a Herculean effort on his part just to stay sober and bring his kids to Jesus. Y'all, can't you see his master's smile on that last day as the master says to him, as he says to the master, excuse me, oh, master, you gave me life and salvation. I'm not the world's best evangelist. And you know that. I had all these lingering weaknesses that plagued me until my dying day, but because of my efforts, one more person knows you today. I took what you gave me and I doubled it. I've improved your assets. I know of a lady who was discipled by a member of our church. This lady had a really difficult life. I mean, I'll spare you the details, but her, her childhood was awful. 
And then she suffered abuse and criminal mistreatment in her marriage. Both of her children struggled with addiction issues because of the neighborhood they grew up in. Then one day, shortly after she received a diagnosis of an advanced form of cancer, she then got the worst news that a parent could hear. Same day, she got both of these. Her son had died of an overdose. Months before that, her son had come to know Jesus and he'd been clean and sober for almost half of a year. And he'd been the one who actually led her to Christ. He was doing so well. But then he visited a friend's house after school who coerced him to do drugs again. And in one moment of weakness, he overdosed and died. But this mom, this mom who was discipled by one of our members, instead of hating that dealer who gave her son the drugs, she started to reach out to him. Only a few weeks after the funeral, she invited, she invited this kid to her home for a Bible study. And here's the thing. I know you're expecting me to say that a bunch of people got saved in this Bible study and that man became Billy Graham, but, but, but that's not how it went. The study wasn't really successful, at least as we would count success, only a handful of people came. It fizzled out after a few weeks, nobody got saved. But y'all, the amount of faith, love, and grace that it took for this woman to share the gospel with that one man might be a hundred times the investment it would have taken Billy Graham to fill up a stadium. Can't you see her master smile on that last day as he says to her, you took what I gave you and you turned it into blessing. And now a group of people who were very far from me got to see my grace lived out in front of them. You took what I gave you and doubled it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Y'all, we judge our spiritual resume by success. Jesus judges by stewardship. So don't sit on that talent. No matter how small you think it is or how insignificant you think you are, because see, on the other hand, failure to invest what you've been given has serious consequences. The master calls this lazy servant wicked. Again, in the kingdom of God, there's more than one way to be wicked. You can be wicked through sins of commission, breaking the commandments, or you can be wicked by sins of omission, just failing to invest what God gave you for his kingdom. Have you been a good steward of what God gave you? Are you ready right now, right now to stand before God and give account of how you stewarded the time, the treasure and the talent that he's given you? Friend, understand this, with grace comes responsibility. Paul in the book of Romans actually uses the word debtor. I'm under obligation to those who haven't heard the gospel. Because God gave me the grace of hearing the gospel, because he gave me all these privileges that I did not earn. God didn't choose me to hear the gospel because I was a better person than anybody else. It's just a gift of grace. But because of that, because of that, I owe something to those who have not heard. And if I don't double the investment of this grace, I'm robbing my master. You say, how are you robbing your master? Well, imagine you work for Compassion in the Dominican Republic. And the CEO of Compassion contacts you and says, hey, good news, good news. We just received a huge million dollar donation and I'm transferring it to your account down there so you can distribute it to those needy kids. But instead, you just let it sit there. You'd be robbing the donor of his investment and robbing the kids of the grace that was supposed to have come to them. Even worse, of course, would be if you used that money on yourself, used that million to upgrade your house or increase your lifestyle down there. That's how God thinks about those of us who do not invest what he has given to us into his kingdom. Y'all, this is serious stuff. These servants receive the harshest condemnation, maybe Yo, know, you're the kind of person who believes all the right things and you live a good moral life and you come to church, but if you have failed to leverage your life for the kingdom, have you actually ever started to follow Jesus? His command was not be a better person, stop cussing, give a little bit to tithe and come to church. His command was follow me. It's like when, when one of Charles Spurgeon's students asked him, Pastor Spurgeon, how can the lost be saved if they never hear about Jesus? Spurgeon responded, that's a good question, but the better question is, how could we actually be saved if we fail to go and tell them? Number three, here's a third question. What keeps so many from investing for the master? What keeps so many from investing for the master? What, what kept the one servant in this parable from investing? Well, he actually tells you, doesn't he? Verse 21, he's, he just says, I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. In verse 22, Jesus says, yeah, by your words, You've condemned yourself. By your words, you let me and everybody else know you didn't really trust me. 
even though this story shows the master to be so generous and so patient and so wealthy, that becomes all the more potent when you consider that the master who's telling this story, Jesus, is on his way where? To Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. What's going to happen in Jerusalem? He's going to die for the sins of his rebellious servants. Has there ever been a master more gracious than Jesus? A master more worthy of the entrustment of your life? Now, let me be really clear, okay? To really follow Jesus involves risk. It's scary because you got to take your hands of control off of your life and you got to yield control to him. And you got to stop seeing your resources, your, your time and your treasure and your talents. You got to stop seeing those primarily as assets by which to build your kingdom and instead see them as entrustments given to you to build his. To really do that, you got you to you you know that Jesus is worthy of the entrustment of your life. That was a phrase my dad repeated over and over again when I was growing up. I often use it here. Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Those words were penned by a man named C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was England's most well-known professional athlete at the turn of the 20th century. He played cricket, which I know is not that impressive now. I feel like it's kind of a goofy game, but, but in those days, it was the most popular sport in the world. Please don't send me YouTubes of awesome cricket players. Okay, I, I get it. It's hard, and, but I'm just saying in our culture, it's, we don't see that as a, you know, a central you know, kind of thing. So, but, but back then, it was like the deal. This guy was the Patrick Mahomes or the Lionel Messi of cricket. But at the height of his career, he walks away from all of it to become a missionary to India and then later to China, where he dies in relative poverty. Y'all, imagine if one of those guys did that today. Imagine if LeBron holds a press conference later. I'm taking my talents and I'm going to South Sudan to live as a missionary there. I'll never play basketball again. When people asked C.T. Studd why he would do that, he said that phrase, only one life to live will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. But the other thing he always said, which to me is every bit as important, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice could be too great for me to make for him. In other words, my master is worth the offering of my life. By the way, if you're gonna be a professional athlete, to have the last name Stud, I mean, that is like on point, am I right? Summit, when I think about what this parable means for our mission in the triangle right now, 2022, here are my conclusions. All right, letter A, all we need to accomplish our mission, it's already in our hands. These servants didn't have to ask the master for resources, did they? No, he'd already given them all that they needed. Y'all, what if everything necessary for this church to reach this community in this year was already in our hands? Here's the second conclusion. Each of us in this church is gonna be judged by how we, how we use what was entrusted to us. Here at the, at the Summit Church, we often use the word steward when it comes to our resources. A steward is not the owner of something. A steward merely manages it on behalf of the owner. If I take my money to a financial investor and I give it to her, that's not her money to use however she wants. That's my money that she manages for me. She's the steward, not the owner. And that means the most important question she can ever ask is, what does JD want done with his money? And that's conclusion C, the most important question any of us can ever ask. Why did God give me what he gave me? That might be the most important question you will ever ask about your life. Why did God give you what he gave you, y'all? Because that house, not yours. That car, not yours. Those talents, not yours. That bank account, not yours. That was a big theme in our devotional this week is transforming from stewards or from owners to stewards because many of us have fallen into the trap of thinking like owners. And because we think like that, we become resistant, even, let's be honest, resentful when God asks us to give. (laughs) Who are you, God, to demand some of my money? And God's like, excuse me? Parents, it's kind of like when you go into the gas station to pay for gas and, and, and on the way out, just out of the goodness of your heart. I mean, just in a, in a moment of parental kindness, you buy your kid a bag of cookies or snacks. They weren't even asking for it. And when you hand it to them, you ask for one and they say, no. 
these are mine. And you're like, the audacity. Kid, you need me to remind you who paid for that. And while we're at it, who bought the clothes you're wearing and the car you're sitting in and provided everything else of value in your life? I remember hearing Will Smith in an interview, pre-slap Will. He was talking about his kids. Can't quote him as much anymore, but this is pre. And the interviewer said, he said, Will, when did your kids learn that they were rich? And Will interrupted the interviewer and he said, let me just stop you right there, champ. I'm rich, my kids are not. I let them use some of my money, but it's not theirs. Same thing with us and God. God owns all that we have. Even if you feel like you earned all the money you have by yourself and you pulled your up by, put yourself up by your bootstrap, so to speak, a kind of American myth, the opportunities and talents and health that you used to make that money came from him. It's all his. It's not that only 10% is his and the other 90% is all ours. All of it is his. And so the most important question you'll ask about your life is, God, what was your purpose in giving these things to me? He's given us the minas of our time and our treasure and our talent. He's already given it. He's already put it all right here that we need to get the job done. So the question is, have you asked him that all important question? What is the purpose, God, that you have for me and what you gave me? Because whatever it is, he wants you to double it for his kingdom. He's given you salvation, double it. Make a disciple. He's made you a small group leader, double it. Plan a new small group. He's given you Bible knowledge, double it. Teach what you know. You might not be the best teacher. Maybe you got a one Mina teaching gift. That's okay, double it. Mentor somebody, teach your kids, tutor an at-risk kid through one of our community outreach programs. He's given you money, double it. By investing in what God is doing here, think about your careers. How are you using your career for his kingdom? We often tell our, our, our college students, you students that are young professionals, that what it means to follow Jesus is to do what you do well to the glory of God. He didn't make you all to be pastors. He didn't make you all to be worship leaders or writers, but he made you good at something. Do that well to the glory of God, but also do it somewhere strategic for the mission of God. The most unreached parts of the world live in what missiologists call the 1040 window. It's think Northern Africa and the Middle East and that, 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 that band that stretches across the world. It's very difficult for missionaries to get into, but you can get there through business easily. You say, well, why would I, why would I do that when there's so much need here? Simple, because that's what our master told us to do. Make disciples of all the nations, he says. I mean, think about it. If you were an EMT, this is how people think. If you're an EMT and there was an earthquake and you came into a building full of hurting people, you would never leave that group right in front of you to drive across town to help a different group unless that's what your supervisor told you to do. Our master Jesus had said that this gospel must be preached among all nations. So we don't go overseas because Raleigh Durham is fixed. We go overseas because our master told us to. And maybe you ought to consider going. If so, you ought to start a conversation with your campus mobilizer today. You say, who's my campus mobilizer? Talk to your campus pastor. They'll tell you who it is. By the way, for you college students, one very practical thing that you can do is consider joining what we call our city project for the summer. It's an incredible eight-week program where you live in housing that we provide while you do theological training and mission trips for the summer. You may not know what God has called you to in life yet, but this is a way of exploring your spiritual gifts and learning those skills of discipleship that you'll need wherever you go. For our retirees, use these years to invest in the kingdom. An older friend of mine calls this season of life, he calls it his preferment instead of retirement because now he can do whatever he prefers to do. Use your preferment for the kingdom of God. You ought to consider giving a few years to go and serve on one of our teams. We can't figure out a way for you to do it through us. We'll hand you to the North Carolina Baptist Convention we work with and they'll figure out somewhere for you to go. Double those free years of your retirement by investing them in the kingdom. For many of you, God has given you a home. Double it by showing hospitality, open it up. Maybe you got a 10 Minas home. Use that well, friends, because you're gonna have to answer for every square foot. He's given all of us time. 86,400 seconds every day that he puts into your account. Oh, this one is so important. Your time is not your own. You understand that, right? Your time, every second of it is on loan. You gotta work, play, and love and rest like your master has commanded. 
By the way, in saying that, I don't mean that you're gonna engage every second in unending, wearying work. After all, Jesus commands us to rest. I just mean that you recognize that every second belongs to him, so we work, play, and rest as we think he would want us to. How much of your time are you directly investing in his kingdom, volunteering or serving? God has given each of you minas of time, treasure, and talents. Don't cover them. Don't cover them with a handkerchief. Let this handkerchief represent all those other things that you might use your time, treasure, and talents for. And you just slowly, not not maliciously, but you just slowly start to bury it, pursuing a life of leisure, golf, boating, beach houses, getting your nails done, or video games, or TikTok, or whatever it is for you. Sometimes somebody will say to me, a lot of, a lot of times it's a parent of a college student who feels called to go with one of our church plants overseas. And they'll say to me, I don't want my son or daughter wasting their lives as a missionary. We raised all this money to send them to UNC Chapel Hill or NC State or Meredith, the Peace or North Carolina Central. We're investing all this money and they got all this talent. They got into the school. We don't want them to waste those talents and that money. Is that a waste? Not if this parable is true, it's not. Let me tell you what is a waste little feature story from a financial magazine. Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was only 59 and she was 51. Because of their wise investments, they retired early and they now live in South Florida where they cruise around in their 30 foot trawler, play softball and collect shells. You say, that sounds amazing. I'd love to be able to do that one day. Let me quote, John Piper here. Bob and Penny achieve the American dream. The American dream, come to the end of your life, your one and only life, and let the last great work before you give an account to your creator be, I collected shells. Look, Lord, look at my seashell collection. That's a tragedy. That's a waste. And yet people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Today, I'm here to plead with you, don't buy it. Don't waste your life. It's popular now, I've told you, for people to live by a bucket list. A bucket list is a list of things you wanna do before you kick the bucket. I want you to think about a bucket list in light of this parable. The Bible says that our master's kingdom, the one that he has gone to receive, the one he'll share with us one day, it's a renewed heaven and earth, which means that it will contain all that we loved about the earth down here just without the curse of sin. And that means that whatever you miss out on on earth down here, whatever you miss out on, you'll make up for in abundance there. I may never make it to the earthly Iceland. I've heard it's beautiful, it's awesome. But that's just the cursed one. If I never get there, that's okay. One day I'll experience the heavenly one. I may never own my own private jet, but that's okay. In heaven, I won't need one. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to fly around up there. I may never get to climb Mount Everest here, but if not, that's okay. This Mount Everest is just the cursed one. I can't wait to see the heavenly one. There's only one thing. There's only one thing I cannot do in heaven that I can do right now. And that is invest these minas that he's given me in bringing people to Jesus. So that's the only thing that should go on my bucket list. They all need a chance to hear, all of them. So I wanna take these minas and I wanna double them for my master in heaven. I want you to bow your heads if you would at all of our campuses. What's the spirit of God saying that you should open your hands from right now so that you can invest? Is it some of your treasures? Is it one treasure in particular? So you say, why? Why are you holding on to that? Why don't you transfer that into my kingdom? It's not doing you any good here. Why not transfer it into something that will last forever? Maybe it's your time. Maybe God's speaking to you about, hey, you need to rethink the stewardship of your time. How about your talents and your skills? You ever laid down your career on the altar and just said, God, wherever, God, whenever, God, whatever. To be personal, something 
I've thought about recently as I've worked my way through our devotional. Veronica and I have been talking about this. What if you're a five Ninas person, but you're only investing two of them? It's not that you're not fruitful. You are. Everybody looks at you and says, oh, you're very fruitful. But if you're only planting a part of what God has given you, one day I'll answer to God, not just for what I harvested, but I'll also answer for what I failed to plant. I don't compare my accomplishments to anybody else's. I'm comparing them to what he gave to me. I doubled all of them. You ready to answer to him, are you? Because the king is returning soon. Father, we pray, we offer our lives to you. We open up our hearts to just say, Lord, whatever, wherever, whenever. We're ready to follow you, we pray. Make these words true, we pray. Hey, friend, if there's God, something God is speaking to you about right now, just surrender it now, right now. Surrender it to him. Let's stand to our feet at all of our campuses as our worship teams come and they lead us to express our surrender to God through the gospel.